Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, I'm catching up with John Kosar from Asbury Research. We'll talk about how the markets are evolving very rapidly here on Fed Day. Certainly, it's sell-off uh, after the uh, meeting minutes and Powell's press conference, bouncing up a little bit going into the close to settle in right at the zero level, the unchanged level. We are uh, sideways with the S&P at 4350, but technology maintained the top mark of all the sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a foggy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market environment using the power of stock charts, using the technical analysis toolkit to try and make sense of these markets in uncertain times. I'm often asked during days and weeks like this, you have, I mean, do we need any more potential catalysts for stocks with the Fed meeting with mega cap earnings, Tesla, Microsoft, and, and many others, uh, uh, Supreme Court justice retiring. I mean, it's just this, this never-ending flow. But I would argue at the end of the day, this is an ideal time, time to look at charts because it tells you the aggregate reaction of all those things. What are people anticipating? What are people nervous about, excited about? Desperation, euphoria, optimism, pessimism, all of those arguably are reflected in the price of assets. And by looking at that, those on charts over time, we can better quantify what investors are doing, how they're voting with their capital. And I think this is a perfect time to try to do that. A choppy day, as always, when you have the uh, the Fed meeting, we certainly saw that today. The market looked a certain way going up to 2 p.m. Eastern. Very different look going into the uh, into the close. But at the end of the day, we're faced with a lot of the same is issues and, uh, and potential tailwinds and headwinds that we've been talking about. Interest rates, inflation, uh, and uh, a market that is clearly rotating into a uh, distribution phase. We'll get to uh, all of that and more here. Uh, we have a great guest today, John Kosar. John does a great job of, uh, of uh, taking days like this and giving us some good context and charts we should be focused on. Uh, later this week, we have Jeff Huge from JWH Investments joining the show tomorrow. Next week on February 1st, we have the guys from Go No Go Charts, Alex, uh, Alex Cole and Tyler Wood will be coming on the, uh, on the show. Also, we just recorded earlier today our latest episode of The Pitch. If you want to see three strategists struggling to make good picks, recognizing the fact that the markets are in turmoil, you will see three pros do it uh, with ice in their veins. Mary Ellen McGonigal, Jay Woods, and Joe Rabel did a fantastic job. We actually recorded it just before the Fed, uh, the Fed meeting minutes were released. They did a, a really good job just talking about some of the issues to think about in the coming months and some of the stock ideas to, uh, to put to work. So go to stockcharts.com slash the pitch to watch that episode. It actually airs tonight at 5 p.m. Eastern. After that, we'll put the replay on that website. You can see all of our, of our uh, previous episodes on there as well. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. So certainly a, a volatile session among volatile sessions. Uh, but, uh, but today you had a, a certain look going up to uh, the Fed meeting. The market sort of rallying going into the 2 p.m. Uh, Fed minutes released. A little bit of a gap up and then dropping fairly consistently. The press conference happens around 2.30. We bottom out around 3.15. Made up a little bit of, uh, of gain. The S&P finished just below the zero level. So we made it all the way back just about to where we uh, where we closed uh, yesterday on Tuesday. So the S&P closing just below 43.50. The Dow down a little more than that. The Nasdaq finished uh, flat as well. The VIX increasing. And, I, and this is this day was the definition of volatility. So not surprised to see the VIX continue to push a little bit higher and, uh, and well above uh, 30. A couple of things moved fairly significantly uh, here in the afternoon. Uh, interest rates certainly coming uh, going higher. Bond markets sold off uh, after the, uh, the Fed meeting uh, in, the, in the afternoon. Uh, you saw the 10-year uh, yield increase to around 185. Most of that came uh, after 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we'll look at a long-term chart of interest rates here uh, a little later. Uh, the dollar index actually increasing, going up about half a percent using the UUP. Gold and silver down fairly significantly today with the GLD down 1.6%. We've talked about that 
overall improvement in the price of gold today, not helping that thesis at all with uh, with the GLD coming off, silver coming off as well. Commodities as a whole did okay, and the energy uh, energy uh, uh, groupings within uh, within the commodity space uh, doing just fine. The USO up over one percent today. Cryptocurrencies all over the place is the uh, is the best way I can describe what happened. I'm preparing for the show and you see Bitcoin spiking higher above almost to 39,000. And I'm thinking, well, this is an interesting sort of risk off feel uh, right after the, uh, you know, right around the Fed. I mean, it's kind of an interesting, uh, interesting thing. Gave all of that back and uh, currently around 37,000, not too far from where we were uh, at the end of the uh, the 24 hour session yesterday, Ether uh, as well had a big spike higher to around 2,700 down to 2,500 now. So plenty of uh, volatility in the crypto space. And we talked recently in uh, in recent months about how uh, cryptocurrencies, I, I think, arguably could be used as a general sense of uh, risk appetite. Right? Uh, you know, if you think of cryptos as a relatively pure play on speculation, you can get the trends there and make a uh, you know, think uh, how that relates to speculation and other asset classes like equities. Let's look at a chart of the S and P 500. Try to make sense of uh, of today's trading and how it fits into the big picture. So, you know, the big move really. So, you have the breakdown of the 200 day moving average. The lower trade here on uh, on Monday, and that was Friday going through the 200 day. Uh, we have Monday sort of chopping around Tuesday, Wednesday. So that's three days we've sort of traded at or below 4,300, but we have yet to close below it. So today was the lowest close of this uh, of this uh, drop. So if you're thinking of the overall move from the closing high around 4,800 to where we're at, this is the low watermark so far. But on an intraday basis, I think it's interesting to see that we've traded below 4,300 a couple times now. And every time we've actually closed back above that level. That uh, amber shaded area is tying us to the lows from September and October of last year. That was that uh, really ended up being the deepest pullback in 2021 before we made new highs in uh, in October, November, and then into January, which ended or December and then January, which ended up being uh, the uh, the all time high there around 4,800. So now we're back. We've round trip to those lows, and it's interesting to see a level of support broken a number of times, but not held right on a closing basis. So I still see 4,300 as a fairly significant level to uh, to be watching. That uh, all time low now or, or low for this move uh, is around 4,225, 4,230 or so, uh, and that might be the next level to watch. So we remain oversold. Uh, on the daily chart of the S&P 500, really showing the severity of this move in a relatively compressed uh, period of time. And just think of it in terms of uh, uh, of timeframes, right? We first got to 4,300 back here in June, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six months of price action going higher, given up in a, in a, in a week or two, uh, really maybe two to three weeks coming off of the, the January high to where we're at now. So plenty of, uh, of destruction on an absolute basis, but some key support levels like 4,300 still appearing to hold. Uh, so those are, those are some important levels to, uh, to watch. You know, it was an interesting day today as we were recording the pitch earlier, and I was talking with our three panelists about just, you know, overall positioning and how to think of these big picture themes with individual ideas. Uh, you know, it was interesting to see technology at the top of the list going up into the Fed meeting. It was very much a growth over value feel to the day, uh, at least in the morning where you had tech uh, at the top of the list and you had some defensive things at the bottom. The, the dynamics of the day changed a bit and you saw financials and energy ended up uh, second and third uh, for the day. Financials are the only other sector besides technology finishing uh, in the green Everything else down for the day with real estate, communication services, and materials uh, leading the way lower or uh, or struggling to uh, to hold up with the uh, with the overall uptrend uh, in stocks. You know, we talked a lot about the energy sector. If we can go over here to the RRG, you know, when you think about the rotation of the eleven S and P sectors, it's 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 certainly been by by any measure I've seen energy and everything else is the way I would generally describe it. Only one of the S and P sectors is still. In the green year to date, and it's energy right up at you know double digits, while most things are actually down for the year. So it shows you what a what an outlier energy has been. So it's not surprising when you're looking for stocks that are screening well. I was screening earlier today um, for stocks making new uh, three month highs. Found a lot of energy names, names like Chevron and Exxon, some of the major uh, you know big mega cap integrated oil stocks. Uh, you know, in these nice, consistent uptrends, if you, it's interesting, I think, to look at a chart like this. And if you look at the chart of Chevron, you would not guess that the markets are struggling and are over 10 percent off of, uh, you know, all time highs. This looks like a, a market that's in a pretty decent uptrend. And it is depending on which sector that you're uh, you're looking at. 
a lot of these energy stocks, energy stocks are, uh, are are sort of up against uh, up against all time highs or uh, or flat out making them. And what's most compelling about this sector right now is the fact that the relative strength uh, continues to be so strong, right? And, and that's when you know when stocks like this are holding up, even just holding up while a lot of other names are rotating lower. That's where the relative strength really starts to uh, improve. And again, if your goal is to do better than just owning the spiders, uh, and you know you want to own names where the relative strength is improving, and you're certainly seeing that in uh, in charts like uh, like Fang. I tried to get uh, some of our uh, commentators earlier today to uh, to pick a stock like Netflix. I got no takers out of the three. I I had no buyers of this one. I even you know posed it afterwards at the Q and A. You know what would you need to see? And they all sort of said something I'm not seeing today. And it's interesting. I, you know, I, I always tell people a couple of things. Number one, never confuse the bottom of the page with support. And that's one thing to recognize, right? Stocks like Netflix and others usually go down for a reason. When people talk about sort of the falling knife chart and, well, is it a great idea because it's down so much? I usually think, look, I don't know, you know, maybe about the particular reasons why the price is moving on a stock like Netflix. I, I mean, I think it's pri- pretty, pretty widely followed, but on any given ticker, you may not know all the specifics. But I would tell you in general, prices tend to go up and they go down for a reason. They go down because people buy into the long-term thesis or they don't. And the chart of Netflix with a gap lower and then continued inability to show any signs of life tells you that in, in, in a lot of ways from a technical perspective, probably a chart to be avoided. We need to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with today's guest, John Kosar. We'll see you in a minute. Everyone, welcome back to the final bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. It's great to have you join us every weekday after the close as we break down the market activity. Thanks for joining us on a Fed day as we try to make sense of things from a technical perspective. We're going to get to today's guest, John Kosar, in a few moments. A couple of quick announcements before we do so. We love to hear from you. And please send your questions in so we can use them in our final bar mailbag. We'd love to answer your question live on the air. You can get your questions to us three ways via email. The final bar at stockcharts.com via Twitter at final bar SCTV on our YouTube channel. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our stock charts channel. We'll gather all those questions and hope to answer one of yours in our next mailbag segment. Also, go to stockchartstv.com. That's our on demand platform. Great guest discussions like uh, the one I will have here shortly with John Kosar, special events like the pitch, our market outlook series. Uh, from January and much, much more, all for free. Go to stockchartstv.com or on your mobile device, just search for Stock Charts TV On Demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, John Kosar. John's the founder of Asbury Research in the Chicago area. He's been on the show a number of times, always brings a great sort of big picture perspective to what we're seeing. John, welcome back to the show. Hi, it's good to be here. It's a very interesting day today. I, I appreciate you with a great amount of courage coming on the show on uh, Fed Day when there's a <laughs> lot of uncertainty, a lot of movements. You're starting with, with, the, uh, with your chart of the S&P 500. How does today's action fit into the big picture for you? You know, it was a lot of noise, but it really didn't do anything meaningful. Uh, mm-hmm. You could see the orange line is the 200-day moving average. Let's call that 44.40. Uh, we came right up to it, closed really right on top of it. Um, that's the beginning of the resistance level for me. And it stretches a little bit, especially with the volatility in the market. You got to kind of widen your levels a little bit so you're not stopping yourself out all day. But I would extend it up to 44.95 to 45.31, which you could see there in red. And those are the lows from DS3 and DS20 of last year. So then you go to the underside of that, and there's a, just a bunch going on there. You've got the May 2020 high over to the left lower part of the screen. Then you have the July 19th low of last year. Kiss that level again. October 1st came close to it. So what I did was kind of merge those two levels into one. 42.79 to 42.38 is the exact price. We came right down to it two days ago. Um, Huge reversal day. Um, Biggest one I can remember. Uh, and then we kind of came down and came close to it 
yesterday. And today we're right dead in the middle of that range. So to me, you know where your levels are. We haven't really resolved anything. And it looks to me that we're in the midst of an emerging major bearish trend change, according to the S&P 500. I love the way you laid out these ranges. And it, it, it gives sort of a framework, I guess, John, to what's happened, right? You had that initial sell-off. And then the question is, what's next? And now you sort of have a level of resistance and a level of support to, uh, to play off of. Now, a lot of times you bring a, a version of the second chart, which is looking at total net assets in the SPY. What is this telling you? I was going back and forth. There were so many great charts that I could have brought today. You know, the VIX was another one. Uh, there's one, two, three, four. I think there's five different major or I would significant um, indexes that are all testing support. It isn't just the S&P. You see it all over the map. But this one stuck out to me because this shows actual conviction to hold spiders overnight. And I think it's really important. So what you can see there on... There's a lot going on on that chart, but basically on January the 13th, the total net assets invested in SPY went through their 21 day moving average. That's one business month and that's our tactical time period here at Asbury. That suggested to me that we're in a monthly trend of contraction. Money was coming out, and we were likely to get a breakdown. What I have found looking at these over the years is that these previous big levels in assets act as a precursor to the support you're gonna find that on the chart. So if you look at the red circle there and take that all the way across to the left, you'll see on September 16th, that was a peak of $409.7 billion. And we came down to it on DS1. You can see DS1, if you take your, take your cursor straight up, that was a bottom right there. It held that level, go up to the S&P 500 and you'll see that that was a bottom. Well, now we're testing the level again. That tells me, I want to see what those numbers look like tomorrow. If, and especially today, because it closed right on the 200 day and basically flat for the day, I want to see if that expanded or contracted. If I see a bunch of new money going in there, this might be a bottom that we can at least trade for a couple of weeks. If mm -hmm. I see the money through there, through that 409.7, that tells me it's probably going to 384.7 billion next. Which is, the low, which is the low from October the 4th, back to the lower panel. And that means we have more weakness coming and we're probably gonna break the lows that we made earlier this week. Now, going back to your chart of the S&P uh, earlier than uh, John, uh, previously you've brought on your Asbury 6 model, six components sort of measuring trend and breadth and other things. How does that relate? You know, What's the big picture bias using your models versus what you're seeing on the chart here? Asbury 6 moved to negative on the 14th of January, and that was a Friday. And then our CPM, the correction protection model, that turned to risk off one day later, actually, because of the MLK holiday on Jan the 18th. So both of our tactical models went back to back negative or risk off um, in between the 14th and the 18th, and they still are today. So I still have kind of a lean in the market based on the weak internals as indicated by those two models. We only have about 30 seconds left, John, but I'd love to know, we talked earlier in the market recap, how energy has been working while pretty much everything has not. Do you chase some of those names that have worked so well at this point, or do they feel more overextended technically that you need to wait off a little bit? What would you say? Well, our... Our sector model three weeks ago, it went overweight energy because it saw a lot of money moving there. Mm. Um, but the individual components, some are off to the races, some are just starting now. So yeah. I think you look to see maybe what's undervalued versus XLE and maybe look to buy some of those off of a support level, some place where you can get some leverage. You could buy it and you could put a stop two, 3% underneath, you know, four or five tops, I think. But I think stick with the sector until the money stops going there and look for the ones that haven't caught on yet and maybe you can get some bargains. Yeah, that's a great point, John. We'll have to leave it there. Listen, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show today. Stay safe there in Chicago. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. That's John Kosar. John's the founder of Asbury Research based in the Chicago area. And I love that, that framework of looking at the uh, S&P chart, thinking about those ranges, thinking about the December lows, sort of in that 4,500, 4,530 range, the, uh, the uh, lows from uh, 2021 earlier in the year, around 40, 
4280, we'll call it to 42, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, a little bit above there, 4280, 40, 4230 to 4280, I meant to say. Uh, but I love that thinking about the, the market in terms of that range and seeing where the next leg evolves. Those are uh, some important uh, price ranges to pay attention to. Great take there from John Kosar. We need to wrap uh, this, uh, this segment, go to the next one. Don't fight the Fed. Today is Fed Day. Uh, and uh, we've talked about a number of different ways, but I think it's important to particularly look at interest rates, uh, given what's, uh, what's happened here. We were talking earlier in our market recap. We touched briefly on the interest rate environment. Uh, and, uh, you know, after the uh, meeting, 2 p.m. Eastern, you saw rates spike to the upside. You saw uh, bond prices come down here as a reaction to that. And, and you know, and again, the, the longer term history that, that I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of people have in mind is this prospect of higher rates. Um, when we, uh, when I'm on camera, if you look behind me uh, on the uh, camera shot we use, I have two charts uh, on my wall in my home office. The one of them, I think, to your right as you're looking at the screen, is the uh, the ten-year uh, or the long bond yield going back for decades, back to the early 1900s, and that's to illustrate the uh, uptrend in rates to around 1980, the huge downtrend in rates that we've seen. So most investors, including me and many others have really not invested in a rising rate environment, at least in, not in an extended one. We've seen periods, shorter term periods of, uh, of rising rates, but not extended periods of that. And, and, and it's a very different environment. I think a lot of investors uh, are, uh, are familiar with. We're gonna back this chart up just a little bit. This is the chart of the, uh, the TNX that we usually refer to. Let's start with the shorter term actually to see what's happened today. So this is the move that you saw higher in the, uh, in the 10 year yield with the dollar sign TNX going to 185. That matches where we were last week when we sort of hit that peak for this cycle. Uh, you know, rates came down quite a bit to, uh, to early March of 2020 when the 10 year yield was below half a percent, then came higher to around 175 in the first quarter of last year. Middle of the year around the summer, we got down to around 111, 115, and now round trip back to those previous highs. This, uh, I've, it's been called sort of a cup and handle like pattern, which I think is totally fair. That, you know, at the very least, that resistance range around 170, 175, which is highlighted here in blue, that has served as resistance a number of times. We've seen rates bounce down below that level. Until this month, in 2020, new, uh, 2022 has now seen uh, the 10 year yield eclipse its previous high from 2021. We're now above where we were in March of 20, uh, 2021, back above 180. And I think staying above 170, 175, that blue shaded area sort of maintains that, uh, that higher interest rate thesis that I think is, uh, is so likely. I think that's something that you should be pricing in. And anything, if you're looking out months uh, you know, plus, if you're looking three to six months plus down the road, I would certainly hope you're thinking about rising rates being a part of that and what that would potentially do to your portfolio if you take on certain positions now with a longer term time frame. Because I think that's the reality we have to deal with. Now, the problem with the chart, if you're looking at the last year or the last two years on the 10 year yield is we're up the, uh, at the top of the page. And I've always been told, never confuse the top of the page with resistance. It's very easy to sort of uh, you know think of just because we've gone up a lot that that might be the end of the move. But let's put a proper long-term perspective. Just going back about three and a half years, this takes us back to late 2018, which was the last peak in uh, interest rates in the, in the 10 year before rotated uh, lower. Back here on the left side of the chart, and this is sort of the third, fourth quarter of 2018, you can see that the 10 year yield was above 3%, it was around 325 here before we uh, traded lower. This green trend line, by the way, is connecting the November 2018 high, the December, 2019 high lines up pretty well here just with the January 2020 high that lines up with November of 2020, which is why when we broke above that level, that is when I drew this trend line on here and thought, all right, this could be a big sea change from lower rates to higher rates. And while we've had some certainly some fits and starts and this pullback here in the uh, you know spring of 2021 was a significant one. At the end of the day, we're still much, much higher than we were back at this point. And that breakout above trendline resistance has, uh, has seen plenty of follow through. And the reason why I'm looking at this time frame is to think, when, now that we've broken above 170, 175, what's next? I think what you want to do is look left on a longer term chart like this and see where some key levels might be. Back here in the end of 2019, we hit resistance around 2% below. There's actually around 195. Might be a level to look at here, which is uh, coming up very shortly. I will be looking at this next Fibonacci uh, resistance level. It's around 215. That comes up, lines up with where we were at in uh, excuse me, uh, summer of 2019 back here uh, when we bounced off of that level a number of times. 
that would be an interesting uh, level to expect potential resistance. But then remember, there's plenty of upside. And there's no reason why rates couldn't go much higher than that. The only reason why we couldn't is because we haven't done that in quite some time and believing that the Fed may change their policy uh, along the way there. But from a technical perspective, there is no reason why rates can't go materially higher from here. First things first, we broke above 175. Do we hold it? The next question for me, do we get to 215, 216? And do we hold that? I think at the very least, I'm looking. Uh, I'm looking there, and I, I would not be surprised if we go uh, go even further before all is said and done. So now all eyes on higher rates. I think we're seeing that follow through today. Wouldn't be surprised if we get that uh, rates going uh, going further to the upside. And then when you think about what that means uh, for uh, for different uh, for different asset classes here, we'll go quickly to the mindful investor live chart list. We've got about 30 seconds left before we have to wrap the show. I just want to show you the pure growth versus pure value uh, ratio. This big red arrow, I probably don't need to make it so bold and red. It's uh, it's feeling pretty severe, but that's what the trend has actually done. When this ratio is going higher, that means growth is outperforming value. When it turns lower, that means growth is underperforming value. And that's certainly what we've seen. Just like the market topped out in November, it then continued higher to make new highs uh, into uh, January before we rotated lower. The growth to value ratio has actually been rotating lower well before that. That's showing you a rotation away from the FANG and FANG-like stocks and into more of the value-oriented sectors like energy, financial, some of the cyclical sectors. I would probably be looking there opportunistically uh, if I'm thinking about my portfolio. That is our segment, Don't Fight the Fed. Obviously, a lot of uh, potential uh, things we could touch on there, but I want to focus a little bit on interest rates. We need to wrap today's show. Go to the three and three. Three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is what I call the new Dow theory. Charles Dow, over 100 years ago, pioneered the concept of indexing and also uh, pioneered this idea of looking at multiple parts of the economy and see whether or not they were in agreement. He traditionally used the Dow Industrials and the Dow Railroad Index, which eventually evolved into the Dow Transports. A lot of people, including me, still look at those. But I, what I call the new Dow theory looks at the S&P 500, sort of representing the old economy, and the NASDAQ composite representing the new economy. You can see that both of these indexes have broken their December lows on a closing basis. One of these, the NASDAQ composite, has actually broken its October low. That happened in the last week or so as we've gotten down uh, below 14,000. The S&P closes below 4,300. I would argue that is a confirmed Dow theory sell signal using the new Dow theory indicates that both old and new economy uh, names are rotating lower. The reason why this is so uh, different right now is because this is a tech and, uh, and growth heavy index at the bottom, which has broken down a lot more than more value oriented names that are weighted in the S&P. Keep an eye on that chart. S&P 4,300 is really the level to watch there. Chart number two is fast and all as I was screening for stocks for my premium subscribers and market misbehavior earlier today, shared with them a bunch of tickers that I thought were important to focus on. This is just one of those, Fastenal. It's an industrial stock you may or may not know. And what's interesting about Fastenal is had a really orderly uptrend, to be honest with you. It's underperformed at times because it's just been a slow, steady gainer, while a lot of other parts of the economy have worked uh, in, in a much, uh, much quicker fashion after the March 2020 low. But look at how often it's bounced off of its 200-day moving average, most recently in October of 2021. And before that, in March of 2021, we're right back there. I think this market goes from looking like a viable pullback to a total disaster if Charts like this fail to hold support, which is why I was looking to see if this is able to hold 55. That would keep it above the 200-day moving average. If it fails there, you have to look at the next support, which is here in the October lows around 51, the Fibonacci support around 50, which lines up with the June low. If that would fail, this is a much deeper drawn out pullback to, uh, to be wary of. So charts like this, I think, are key to watch this week. Finally, in our segment, Don't Fight the Fed, we talked about uh, the prospect of higher rates. And again, if I'm you looking at your portfolio, I would be thinking uh, months down the road, think about what higher interest rates are going to do to your portfolio. If you own growthy stuff like the ARK Innovation Fund or those types of names, remember that higher interest rates would be a huge headwind to those performing well. It's going to be a tailwind for things like energy, which remains the top performing sector year to date. Folks, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to John Kosar from Asbury Research joining us from Chicago and sharing some of his thoughts. You can see all of our previous interviews and episodes on our on-demand platform, StockChartsTV.com. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.